Ooh, back in Paris. Okay, so, sorry. Very unprofessional of me. My name is Bliss Foster. I'm an independent professional fashion critic and I go to Paris Fashion Week every season to give you the best insights in the industry. We begin with Loewe, where Jonathan Anderson puts all of his audience's attention on the clothes. Because of that focus on garments, our showroom visit, which industry people refer to as a Reese, was absolutely crucial. Whether you're watching the runways in person or watching on your phone, you're going to walk away from Loewe shows with a lot of questions. And the Reese allows you to have that aha moment because you can examine everything up close. There's already been some reviews that go into the meaning of this collection, so here I'm going to hone in on a few pieces that really stuck out to me. We'll begin with this coat that doesn't seem particularly exciting until you notice that there aren't really many seams on it. The shoulder especially is absent of any seams, yet the coat takes on a very specific shape. We learned by speaking with a sales rep that this incredible feeling fabric was placed over a mold, then heat pressed to take on its shape. We learned a lot about this process in the Margiela series on this channel a few months ago, but unlike Margiela, who used this process to make clothes look worn out and stretched, Jonathan has used the process to create a coat that looks maximally streamlined and just triumphantly simple. And then there's this awesome top that's filled with glitter, much like a stuffed animal or those texture toys that they give to kids. Movement on a runway is always in the conversation and this treatment and this piece makes the top unusually still or like it's moving in slow motion, like a high viscosity slime. Extremely cool. And on that topic, many pieces in this show resisted movement, which is the opposite of what most designers look to achieve. The heat molded coat really kept the model's shoulders still. Stillness is continued in subtle ways, like with this cardigan-esque v-neck coat thing that offers a place for you to rest your arms while you walk. And stillness continues in extreme literal ways, like with this shirt that's more like an exoskeleton or the central pieces of the show, coats that just literally are shaped copper. One thing that really helped me understand how Loewe approaches storytelling was an interview between Jonathan Anderson and Louis Prigent from a few years ago, where Jonathan said this. For me in, in, in fashion, um, uh, for me, it, you can never be done, so it has to be an embryo of something you can never kind of have a definitive look. It is not just one linear thing. And if that's the goal, Jonathan achieves it so well. I can't think of a single outfit or shape that defines Loewe in particular. Loewe feels more like a melting pot of good, playful ideas. When we watch a new Loewe show, we're showing up to see what Jonathan's been working on in the sandbox. Okay, so we're walking up to Dublet, which um, I gotta say is the number one show that I'm looking forward to this week, which may be a little unexpected for some folks. These are experientially the most immersive runway shows that I've ever been in. Last time they had the uh, the snowstorm in the middle of June. It was so thick that you couldn't see anything. <laughs> Honestly, I think it is the most like wholesome, playful brands in the entire world, and I am super excited. And oh my gosh, already, here we are with uh, some balloons and stuff. This is, this is gonna be ridiculously fun. So firstly, this was the only show of the week that was outside. No one else dared to do that because it was freezing cold in Paris. But somehow the goofiness of Dublet made this less painful and mostly just hilarious. Fortunately, they had baby blankets and carnival music to keep everyone warm. I'm really hoping that this music that's playing right now is not copyrighted, but uh, this is ridiculous. This is so funny. <laughs> okay, so Doublet is one of the only brands that makes me laugh in an uncynical way. Everything they do is very lighthearted and intended to be funny first. When I spoke to the designer, Masayuki Aino, through a translator, he said he was inspired by rural carnivals. And you can see all these animals and these monsters in costumes and they're all playing together and having a great time. I know said that there's something there for people to learn from. The carnival music that embodied that theme eventually gave way to death metal music and the actual runway show began. We saw a literal carnival costume of a bunny, a shirt that's cut so it can never truly lay correctly on your body, a cold weather glove insert that's been turned into a onesie. We got a, this is great, we got a bright orange variation on the classic M1 flight jacket except it's now a float jacket because it has these little tie-offs like the ends of a balloon. We have pants that make it look like you're being carried on the shoulders of a bear. And we just have more straightforward goofy stuff like very fuzzy pants, fake VR sunglasses, 
and a lot, a, a surprising amount, of mermaid tales. These shows are such a party. Doublet is still, they remain the funniest brand in fashion. I, I have such a blast at these. Okay, it is time for something particularly special. Maison Margiela had their first physical runway show this season in years. For the past few years, while they took a break from the runway, the Maison brought some of the biggest innovations to fashion storytelling through a series of very long videos that they made in place of a typical runway show. Not only did they return to the runway this season, but they also offered the most immersive showroom experience that I've ever been a part of. There were a number of really wild rooms wherein you could see the clothes contextualized into different scenes that they had assembled, some in some <laughs> particularly evocative ways. They also set up an infinity room, which, I mean, obviously, like, you know, you set up an infinity room, it's going to make a big impact no matter what. Absolutely crazy. But what I was most excited about was being able to see these clothes up close. Since taking command of the Maison, John Galliano has continued the narrative that Martin Margiela started in a way that's certainly different, but at its core, it continues the same ideas. The, the truth is that it's really hard to see the Maison's subtlety of design, whether that's Martin's subtlety of design or John's subtlety of design, it's just hard to see it from the runway. But again, we got the showroom, so here are the secrets. The real standout motif this season was a treatment that looked like mold, but was obviously not actual mold. And I don't know, this maybe seems weird, but when you get past the initial gut feeling of danger, danger, hold your breath, bad, bad, Mold is a particularly beautiful part of nature reclaiming objects. And to me, the craziest part of this was the consistency of the mold detail across different materials. It's really, really hard to replicate a textile treatment like this on everything from cotton to leather to wool. I mean, even the buttons on certain pieces carried this same mark. Then there was this incredible idea with this tool coat where the weave of the fabric was open enough for the different layers of color to visually sink into each other. Absolutely stunning idea. And the consistent theme of the Maison is continued in clothes that look like they've been pieced together at home, right? That's That's been the case all the way from the beginning in 1988. So this is one of the most fascinating parts of the Maison in its current era. Martin Margiela had a very specific look to his refurbished clothes. And that aesthetic is so different from the John Galliano that we saw at Dior. But the extravagance and the way, way, way over the top feeling of Galliano's history is somehow translated really well into the codes of Margiela. We still have very extra clothes here, but they're always clothes that look like they're bringing as much of their own previous life to the wearer as the wearer brings to their clothes. Next up was the Dover Street Market showroom to see one of my current favorite brands, Iray. They just showed their first ever runway show on the Paris calendar, which was phenomenal, to be honest. But the best way to understand what this brand is doing is to hear it straight from the designer and founder, so, Drew. A little bit about the collection. I've been exploring this idea of clothing as protection, as kind of a theme that's overarching. Um, and this is kind of like part three of that theme that I've been exploring in fall 22. It was something about protection from something external. And then spring 23 was this idea of protection from yourself. And I felt like a oh, nice way to wrap it up would be kind of focused on the protector. So like, in a way, the hero's journey. And that's the, the title of this collection is Refuge, Deluge, Transfuge, which is this like, um, safety, then like the flood, you know, the movement, the call to adventure, and then eventually at the end, kind of um, this like transformation into a new person. This is a piece that's made from human hair. And you know, our hair holds up to five times its weight in oil. They looked at human hair and they were like, could we fight oil disasters with human hair? And they figured out that they could. So they make basically doormat thick pieces of fabric. It basically acts as a water filter. Um, so in, in a city, you'll mostly see it surrounding storm drains. And um, hair ended up being the best material solution for that. Yeah. So another collaboration we worked on was with this company in France, and this is actually salmon leather. What? But the best part is, is that it's recycled from sushi restaurants. 
in the area. This company was actually, they were the first people to figure out how to pull the fish oil from the skin, which is what makes it smell bad. Um, which is why that we've never used fish leather as like an alternative to cow leather. So we're using like the discards of the already trashed material. I'm really trying to highlight these like amazing people around the world that are doing like some incredible things and in a way like elevating trash to like this luxury level and sitting it next to like Angora and you know cashmere and silk. Yeah, that's what really got me excited about this season. Seriously, yeah. This is a clipped version of the interview. The full-length interview will be a Patreon exclusive here very soon. Okay, had a short break and now heading out to Botter. This is very unusual because Botter is a comparatively new brand. They're by no means like new, new, but relatively new. And they're showing in Men's Week and they just showed at Women's Week, which is strange because that's a lot for a brand of their size to handle. I mean, you saw from the documentary that we made about them that they are incredibly hardworking and they seem to be able to stay calm under all circumstances. So I'm excited to see this one. I'm always excited to see Botter. It's incredible. Designers Rushimi and Lisi continue to examine how to bring aquatic sensibility to suiting this season on the men's calendar. With this calendar shift comes a more mature exploration of their hallmark Caribbean couture. The cuts are cleaner than ever. For example, the diagonal line created from the pant pocket extending to the opposite shoulder on this look is excellent, but also oddly satisfying. It evokes the peeling off of a wetsuit, a theme that they've explored in their deconstructed suiting in the past, but this is an incredibly impactful evolution of that theme through a very simple addition. And for how seriously eye-catching that look is, what I love about Botter is that they don't take themselves too seriously, because like, you know, bikini dress, car necklace, bike seat bag, monster truck bracelet, Hot Wheels ring. And that mentality even extends to how the show comes together backstage because, I mean, it's it's so great. Everyone is always having such a good time backstage at these shows. Botter's backstage is one of the highlights of my fashion week. Botter always seems to be pushing the shape of shoes forward and this season is no different with these Reebok sneakers that were 3D printed to look like Murex shells. It's a great way of reinterpreting the golden ratio like quality of nature into their collections. Another great idea from this season is an inflatable life preserver inspired jacket where the neon color associated with life preservers has cheekily been swapped with the ensemble worn underneath. Also, the innovative kelp fabric that we saw last season is back here again. Botter makes considered and well-designed clothes, and they're so confident in their methods and the garments born of those methods that they always insist on having a bit of fun with the rest. Okay, so this is maybe the most stressful transition of the week so far. We're going to Comme de Garçon en Plus, which is a huge priority for me personally it means a lot to me and uh, it's stressful because traffic in Paris is like absolutely terrible right now so I'm currently trying to stay calm we legitimately might not make the door currently we are uh, 30 minutes late to the show and we're 10 minutes away we will see all right so bad news we did not make it um, which is okay We'll get them next season. Um, we have a backup show, fortunately, for this time slot, which is Songzio, and their stuff looks great. I'm really excited to go see it. And it's fortunately very close, so we will not be 40 minutes late to this one. <laughs> Okay, well, all the disappointment that you hear in my voice in that clip got amended really, really quickly because this turned out to be an incredible show. The show took place in a parking garage where we had to scale up five levels to reach the backstage area, and I am so, so, so glad that I got to see these clothes up close. From the runway, when you can only really get an impression, these look like costumes, right? Many brands, great brands even, do this. The idea for that season is so huge that they essentially make costumes that aren't really Really finished clothes so that they can serve their purpose on the runway. But these were shockingly finished. I, I guess I didn't try any of them on, but as far as I could tell, there weren't many cheats or tricks with these outfits. They were completed clothes. All the kids in fashion school can vouch for me here. This must have been a monster collection to create. Songzio's show notes explain this well, so I'm going to just briefly quote them. Quote, the double layered pieces, some in one piece and some in two detachable pieces, represent the idea of duality, heavy in stillness, but fluid in motion. 
these layered pieces converge very different textures and designs into one single harmonious piece, end quote. Near the end of Fashion Week, when talking with other attendees about the shows, I'd often get asked what stood out to me, and I probably said a dozen times, Song Zio, that show was fucking metal. I'm really excited to keep an eye on this brand in upcoming seasons. Next up was Yan Yan Vanessa, who was fresh back from Florence at Pitti Uomo, where he showed his first runway show in his company's 13-year history. As always, we hid in the middle of his clothes rack for the interview, and I asked him why he chose now to begin his runway story. Like all the elements we've been working with the last week, the last year, sorry, the, like the dance and the artisanal collaborations we do with the shoes and the hats, and I mean with his weaving, everything got its place in this show. The show was actually like a triptych, like three phases. So first a catwalk, then it broke open into a dance performance. And then when the people thought that was over, there was music outside that kind of lured the people outside when they were in the middle of the courtyard. On the walls, they were all like against the frescoes. We positioned all the models in pairs or, or alone, like in front of the frescoes on a small little pedestal so that people could actually see the clothes and it's like fully painted with frescoes. When the models were in front of them, all the colors just like blended in a way that I got goosebumps from. It was like, this looks so premeditated while it was actually kind of luck. And that was such a, yeah, an amazing effect to, to see them popping out. It was really nice to, to experience. So we're walking up to Junior Watanabe. I'm really excited. This is gonna be really good. This is the first show of the week for us. We started off a little bit late and we're running up right now to like kind of get things started. It's Friday currently, so yeah. right in the middle of Fashion Week. Second Junior Watanabe show for me. First one that is the men's show, and I am uh, super stoked. Let's see what he's got for us. This season, Junior is attempting a mostly black show for men for the first time since fall 2007. Both shows get heavy into motorcycle themes. This season, though, Junior takes on the other side, with the outfits mostly looking like a bizarro, futuristic version of moto racing pit crews. Many of the superfluous pockets bear a strong resemblance to knee and elbow pads. The hats especially set the tone here, despite looking absolutely brilliant, they immediately strike me as the result of something that's been over-designed. Many of the clothes have this look as well, where you kind of get the impression that while each series of pockets and pull systems may have some niche purpose for some very specific job, they bear no practical application for day-to-day -day life. And here's the deal. In the hands of certain designers, I think this over-design is actually a good thing. There are some lesser designers who slap pockets and draw cords onto jackets and it looks like nothing in the end. But in the hands of designers like Junia, fetishizing functionality past the point of practicality becomes a means to build out his world. The wild success of Junia's backpack jacket in collaboration with the North Face must have got him thinking about functionality, not so much as a means to live a more convenient life, but as a way to keep dreaming, which of course is what we like Junior for in the first place. At some point I'm gonna try to like review a show before I've seen it or before I'm familiar with the brand at all. Wow, the color palette was just incredible. That green, wow, that green. And then I'll just see if I'm right. Welcome back to a needlessly detailed review of a show that I haven't seen yet. My name is Bliss Falk. Random Identities was up next in the Dover Street Market showroom. I actually tried to get an interview with him last season, but we couldn't quite make the scheduling work. This is another one where we have about 35 minutes of great conversation, but we can only include snippets here. The full episode will be on the Patreon as an exclusive soon. We'll hear a bit about the new collection and what makes Random Identities special. Okay, I'm Stefano Pilati. Almost now 40 years in fashion. Can we talk about the collection that you have on display now? Yeah, of course. I would love that, yeah. Here, here for example, you know, the first three dummies I put here on suiting, uh, classic double-breasted, uh, you know, but I just put like this little coolies. It was, it, it gives you, it gives, it gives you that touch of femininity, you know, that somehow you want to have, but at the same time you don't dare, but you have it. There are pants, you know, that they have like a little bit of flair, but they cut in a way that this is mesh. And so, you know, the silhouette um, breaks uh, a bit above the ankle and it's really, really nice. Uh, these are the famous, <laughs> I say famous because we really, they really became famous, the Berlin baggies. Famous through you or is this something that's part of the Berlin scene that you kind of took inspiration from? Mm. 
Actually, what I took inspiration from is that I needed a pair of pants to go dancing. <laughs> 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 and then uh, a spencer with blues on uh, sleeves, which is also very nice, uh, with a detail that uh, comes. Oh, fun. Yeah, that comes on. I, I used the cellar on years ago, and now it, I'm, I'm doing it also here. What, what is, what's St. Laurent about this? This. Detail Go, going into going this. Into this. When was he doing that? Uh, no, I did. Oh, at uh, Saint Laurent. I, at Saint Laurent. Yeah, okay, yeah, 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 that's yeah, very yeah. interesting. It was like a, like it was like a, a summer 2008 or something. You know, a two buttons jacket with the detail that you can find also in the pants. That are basically like, um, yeah, got as the they got, you know, cut. That that kind of to me is what I consider to be kind of a hallmark of your brand is this almost robotic like curve. Because mm -hmm. usually, I mean, when, when brands kind of have this almost futuristic mm -hmm. kind of feel to them, sort of the way that yours does, usually they're kind of trying to push those angles towards right angles, mm -hmm. very like mm -hmm. clean, non-natural mm -hmm. angles. Yours all have these very, they're, they're curves, but they feel very robotic somehow. Well, it's an interesting balance that you found with that. Uh, I, what is, never forget that any cut, round or straight, you know, creates tension in the garment, especially when worn. It needs to be really mm, continuous, you know, mm -hmm. to, to, and, and, and precise, but continuous. So you do it, you do it, you do it until it's perfect. And when it's perfect, that's where you get that balance that you perceive. Next up, we had a fantastic long conversation with Leon Emmanuel Blanc, a young designer in the artisanal space. We talked about a wide range of things. Again, that full interview will be on the Patreon soon, but I wanted us to hear just for this one segment, Leon talk about a specific pair of pants that he's known for and how those pants came to be. So speaking of pants, actually the first ever piece I made, speaking of important things, was um, a a lower body piece, let's put it this mm. way. And the idea was I, I wanted to form a, a pants on someone, right? And my friend was like, I don't, I don't want, I don't want, don't do it on me. Like, anyway, I had no one, so I formed it on myself. That's how I came up with the idea of this movement thing. So just formed on myself, right? So if you're forming on yourself something, you keep on moving. Because you need to form on yourself, right? And, then I, and I had to sit down at times and you're sitting and you're forming. And that's how that whole idea of forming in different positions came up. Like it's growing. Yes, yeah, so I didn't have the idea, oh, I'm going to form something in movement and that's how it's going to happen. It's just happened out of a necessity of forming on myself. The surgeon was operating on himself. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> if you move your knees, you're going to be in a certain position that's more fast forward rather than standing is more straight. So you have your seam work obviously making this, this, this anatomical move already. So what I'm doing basically is not designing really anything. The fabric and the body already designs the thing. Mm. This is my idea of it. It's not like, oh, I'm gonna put a line here, that's nice. It's rather, here's the, here's the twirl or whatever I'm forming with, here's your body. What does the movement do to the twirl and vice versa? So it's really just a conversation between your body, movement, and in the end, of course, my mind, because I'm forming it. But even, I mean, like this right here, I mean, that, this I think is a great example of what artisanal clothes making is able to offer the world because you, you were doing something that I think a lot of tailors would maybe look at. Like if you talk to a Savile Row tailor and you were like, well, I'm trying to design these pants, but I don't have a model, so I'm just going to make them on myself. They would be like, that's stupid. You're wasting your time. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But, but then in the end, what you've done is you've created a very skinny pant yeah. that, that offers a lot of range Movement. of mobility. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can see the, the knee kind of, you know, creating the shape. The movement created the shape of the knee. Yeah. And all the lines came naturally through movement and, and what the fabric did by itself. Next up was Ziggy Chen, a Chinese designer who's built a cult following around clothes that seem to start with the beautiful patina of age already built in and then only get better as they actually age. This show was called The Glumsy, which is a portmanteau for vigorous clumsiness. This was awesome. And here's the best way that I know how to explain it. Across the collection, despite there being parts that are beautifully asymmetric, there really was a systematic, almost book report-like quality of what I was seeing. And you can clearly follow Ziggy's train of thought as the looks progress and can almost predict what the next one is as you're seeing them live. 
it's worth noting here that we had to mix these looks up a little bit for the sake of the video, but it, it's well worth watching his original video so you can kind of see what I mean. But yeah, a, a collection that on the runway feels like it was always meant to take that order. That That's something that we don't see a lot anymore. It's now that the, the ideas are all sort of evenly spaced apart or there are separate sections of like, these are the yellow looks, these are the red looks, which isn't the same as seeing the ideas all sort of coexist and negotiate amongst themselves as we saw in this collection. The nice thing though, if, if this is even making sense anymore, is that sometimes we were surprised, like the deep V-neck dress. It preceded the men's take on the deep V, but also ends up turning out a bit more modern than I feel like a lot of the looks in this genre of clothing get for women. Another awesome flip was the pleating on the backs of certain looks. I knew very little about Ziggy's work before I came to this show, but I absolutely loved this collection and I'm excited to dive much deeper into this as I move forward. Next up was an interview with Liberal Youth Ministry, founded and headed up by the first Mexican fashion designer to show in Men's Paris Fashion Week. This is another interview where we have a nice long conversation and that full interview will be exclusively on the Patreon soon. My name is Antonio Zaragoza and I am the founder and designer of Liberal Youth Ministry, uh, a brand that is based at the moment in Guadalajara, Mexico. The collection title is Sinfonia Juvenil, which translates to something like Youth Symphony. It was the first time that I knew that I was going to show my work in Paris. When you hear like a symphony from Beethoven or the Big Busters, you don't really need like a reason for the music to be in you you know like they don't need like an explanation so I wanted the the collection to feel like a symphony of all the things that I love in film I discovered Elephant from Guzman Sant the Elephant movie from who? Guzman Sant okay. the the movie and then Clockwork Orange from Stanley Kubrick a classic also came to my mind I did some 3D printed masks that are just like a, a copy of the masks that the, the guys from the uh, from the movie are wearing oh sick yes okay. well, Perfect. And I really want to create like chaos because I don't know if you you have been in Mexico, but it changed so quickly. If you are moving in a car like uh, something from some something else, and uh, you have like a, a clash of different cultures. It's so funny this thing about Chivas because when this happened and the the photos started to pop in in the media, people in Mexico thought that it was a joke, and it was a meme, and they started to create memes. I don't know. It's just weird. <laughs> We then maneuvered our way across Paris to the undercover showroom. It is brick outside. It is so incredibly cold. This collection didn't have a show to accompany it. We only have a lookbook and a showroom collection. And the, the big moment for this collection is the return of certain motifs from Undercover's men's history. Most notably, the hand from fall 2015 is redone as sequins on the clothes. And Honestly, this is an instance in fashion where retrying an idea produced a better result than the original. I absolutely love how these turned out. To other undercover obsessives like myself, the hand is one of the most recognizable motifs in the history, and I'm, I'm really, this is, in my opinion, this is an appropriate redoing of an idea like that. I also briefly got to talk to a poet from Copenhagen whose work was used in the collection, specifically the line, a wolf will never be a pet on a number of different pieces, most notably a letterman jacket. And that's a line that much like the best poetry carries deep personal significance for the poet, but can take on a new life in the minds of millions of readers. Jun Takahashi has always had an affection for vague but impactful statements in English. And it's cool to see him now sourcing those statements from a professional poet. Okay, hello. Um, we're walking up to Ludovic and it's uh, about 21 degrees Fahrenheit outside, which is like negative of infinity Celsius. This is going to be a really good show because Ludovic just got appointed as creative director of Andy Mühlemeister and the first show of a native brand when they've just been elected somewhere else is always really interesting because sometimes it's like, oh my gosh, I don't have time. And so we kind of do like a reissue of classics and other times there's a, a bit of a change of direction. So we'll see. Sure enough, this collection, entitled Private Show, was a bird's-eye review of all the things that inspire Ludovic, as well as his signature sexy uniform. Even the show notes emphasize, quote, Rather than a meditation on a particular theme or topic, Private Show is perhaps best viewed as an acknowledgement of the vast array of facets and people that have culminated in Ludovic as we know it today, end quote. We have only a little bit of time left before we see a new era of this brand and of the Andamula Meester brand as well. I'm excited for both. 
Okay, so we actually have a really unusual one here. The next brand is White Mountaineering, which is a Japanese outdoors brand that competes on the Paris runway stage. This collection was accompanied by some gorgeously written show notes and a beautifully hardbound photo book. So we're just going to read through the show notes and then I'm going to read you some excerpts from the book and show you the photographs inside. White Mountaineering by Yosuke Aizawa, Fall Winter 23, After All. It has been three years since our last show in Paris. These three years have been a great opportunity to think about the changes around myself and what I'd like to do as a designer. Personally, I'm spending half of my time in Nagano, a place full of nature, instead of the big city Tokyo. I built a mountain cottage there for me to take time to design the garments. Since being away from the fashion industry, time passes by slowly. I was able to live in outdoor environments and I could see the next direction for white mountaineering. I am creating a fashion style combining the high-tech and low-tech with the seasonal products with utility. Mr. Naoki Ishikawa, the adventurer and my old friend who succeeded to the top of Everest, showed me many photographs. I was moved by the beautiful landscapes and the changing colors, and I decided to publish this book. These photographs captured the adventurers putting themselves into challenging environments and the people living there. I have designed the collection of Fall Winter 23 being inspired by these photographs, his stories overlapping my life and nature transforming its appearance. And hey, this is Bliss now. I'm just going to read you a few excerpts from the book, which is titled Manaslu. The trip began in Samagayan, near the border of Tibet. The town sits at an elevation of 11,400 feet and is the starting point for the expedition. The village is in a green valley. Water from the thawing glaciers of the surrounding mountains flows down to become a white waterfall. There is a lot of rain, and Manaslu is hidden by the clouds. I headed to the base camp surrounded by rocks and ice. In the early morning, I looked up from the base camp at an elevation of 15,400 feet to see Manaslu. Beyond the base camp is a world of ice and snow. Giant crevices open the mouths of the glaciers. On September 26, 2022, an avalanche occurred just below the summit, killing one and injuring several others. The avalanche threw Camp 3 into chaos. At 10.24 a.m., I stood atop the true summit of Manaslu. Manaslu was in no way an easy mountain to climb. It was a delicate and solitary peak that at times revealed its cruelty. It was a feeling of fulfillment I have never experienced before, as though I had completely used up my whole body and it was recreating itself anew. Next up was Color, a Japanese brand that focused on playful basics with a heavy deconstruction sensibility. Color, uh, like not the brand itself, but like C-O-L-O-R, is one of the last things that I notice with clothes personally. And my first reaction to this collection, though, was that the color palette was unusually well-defined. Even the looks where surely it's got to be too busy were ultimately met with a well-balanced use of color. Deconstruction was a major player in this collection. Kind of no surprise since the Japanese seem to occupy this genre the most and they usually execute it the best. There were some classic deconstruction techniques like the suiting piece that's simply turned inside out so that all of its inner mechanisms can be appreciated or a kickflip that I never get tired of, the sideways shirt. Then some deconstruction attempts that were more adventurous, like certain garments mirroring other garments in the same outfit. Like here you can see the bottom of this suit jacket on the left is mirrored twice over in different materials that are attached to the skirt. See, it's, it's on the skirt, but it's meant to mirror the jacket. Or here where the top of the corduroy pants are mirrored in the suit coat. Another deconstruction technique here where only the shirt cuffs are 10 times their normal size but have been buttoned up for practicality. Oddly enough, my personal favorite look from this collection was probably the easiest to execute. It's just a slick, oily textile dress with a length of beautifully colored tulle whisking off the back, kind of dancing as the model walked. This was an outstanding Paris Fashion Week, and it's also the quickest turnaround of the year. Men's Week happens in January, and the next Women's Week happens just a month later. So as we're finishing the edit for this episode, we're beginning to pack for the next trip. I'm ecstatic to bring this kind of coverage to you, but this coverage does cost money. So if these videos are useful for you, join the Patreon so that you can see all of the extended episodes, so you can see those extended interviews, and we can keep the channel running. I'll see you soon.